Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your Shabbat. We pray that you'd be with us study today and uh, that it would bear much fruit for you, that it would be things that we could take to our heart and apply in our lives and that we, we would be fruitful for you. In Yahushua's name, amen. Amen. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's a little... Um hand raise button down there if you want to chime in and say something ask a question go ahead and do that my glasses on and then i'm going to try to do my best with this new i kind of just switched to a new software new computer so i, I kind of fumble a little bit with my screen so just bear with me all right so Last time, or previously, the past couple times, we talked about how God placed a mark upon Cain so that no one would take vengeance upon him for killing righteous Abel. And we discussed that perhaps it was because Abel was a righteous son of Elohim whose blood cried out to Yahweh from the ground to avenge him. We looked at many scriptures that teach how God's people must not seek to avenge themselves, and how God himself is the avenger of blood for the righteous and how Yehoshua is coming again to proclaim that day of Yahweh's vengeance. Mike should be posting those two videos today, so if you weren't able to be with us, be sure to go back and watch those. I think it'll make today's lesson a little more complete, but you should still be able to follow along. Today we're going to just kind of talk about a few more points about the, how vengeance belongs to Yahweh, and then we'll be focusing on the mark itself. That Yahweh placed upon Cain. And we're going to do that by seeing how else the word mark is used in the Bible and by comparing Yahweh's mark on Cain to how Yahweh marks his people who guard his words and serve him. See if we can see any parallels or similarities. So Genesis 4.15 is where that verse is. Now um, you can kind of see Genesis 4.15 is highlighted in like a brown color. So that's telling you what verse I'm looking at or reading, and I'll try to highlight as I read those verses. We're just going to look at Genesis 4.15 where it says, And Yahweh said to him, that's Cain, Therefore whoever kills Cain should be avenged seven times. And Yahweh set a mark upon Cain so that anyone who found him should not kill him. So Yahweh said, if anyone takes vengeance upon Cain, then he shall take vengeance on him seven times. The number seven has some significance in this chapter of Genesis. If you, some of you will recall, towards the beginning of this chapter, we previously noted that Abel was identified as Cain's brother seven times. It wasn't just Cain, or it wasn't just Abel. He was specifically identified as Cain's brother seven times just within this short account so there's a connection with the number seven and this brotherly love situation and now we read that anyone who kills cain yahweh will take vengeance on that person seven times then what did we read about cain's descendant lamech last time we're going to look at that verse again genesis 4 23 through 24 so this is cain's descendant speaking and Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man because of my wound, and a young man because of my hurt. For Cain is avenged seven times, and Lamech seventy-seven times. So Cain's descendant, Lamech, who is of Cain's seed, boastfully commits murder, and proclaims that if Cain is avenged by Yahweh seven times, then he's going to be avenged 77 times. So now we have two very specific numbers, seven times and 77 times, that God will take vengeance upon anyone who seeks vengeance upon these sons of the wicked one. So this brings us directly to something that Messiah taught about brotherly love and forgiveness. We're going to look at Matthew 18, 21, and 22. 
Then Peter came to him, that is Messiah, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him until seven times? And Yehoshua said to him, I do not say it to you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Sorry, I lost my place. All right, so Peter speaks specifically about brotherly love and comes up with the number of times that he assumes we should forgive a brother who sins against us. Seven times? And I was wondering if perhaps the story of Cain and Abel prompted Peter to say this. Maybe he saw this pattern of sevens. But then Yehoshua responds by saying, no, 77 times. The two numbers that seem to directly point to the numbers in Genesis 4 regarding the vengeance of Yahweh upon those who seek vengeance. We know sons of God do not murder. Sons of God do not repay evil for evil. Sons of God forgive. Because as we discussed last time, sons of God know that in doing so, they are manifesting the long-suffering goodness and love of God in the earth and figuratively heaping coals, fiery coals of the wrath of God upon the heads of their enemies when Yehoshua comes again as our avenger of blood to avenge his people. So in response to Peter's question about forgiving his brother who sins against him, Yehoshua goes on to tell a parable. So let's read that parable. It's down just a few verses in 23 through 35 about the unforgiving servant. <clears throat> oh, it's just right next here. I don't know why I said that. All right, so he says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven has been compared to a certain king who desired to make an accounting with his servants. And when he'd begun to count, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So he, this guy owes him quite a bit of, of money. But as he had nothing to pay, his Lord commanded that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold and payment be made. Then the servant fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which seems to be a much less significant amount. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. So he's not demonstrating that same mercy of his master. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. And they came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said to him, O oh, wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have pitied your fellow servant, even as, as I have pity on you? And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that was due to him. So, you know, some thoughts that come to mind, and please interject if you have uh, more thoughts on this. But I'm kind of seeing that same pattern of not taking vengeance for yourself and um, also demonstrating the character of God. If you have been forgiven, should you not also forgive? And this um, brotherly love that God's people are to portray in the world and manifest in the world. Keith? Keith, did you want to say something? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot about that technical button. The uh, Lord canceled his debts. So in a way so he knows that he doesn't have what and it was a great amount of debt when he when he said the amount so this servant under him the debts that he had should are so insignificant that uh i don't want to say this his soul shouldn't be troubled anymore to even need to collect his debt because the fact that his debts he doesn't owe that. It's not like someone's coming after him for his debts. 
that he has to go run around to these other people that owe him anyways to uh, collect the debt. He's free of his debts. And yeah. that, idea, that idea that he was still just being greedy, to me, it was more of a sense of greed. No one was pressuring him that he even needed to approach that, that person underneath him that owed him. Uh, if anything, he could have left there rejoicing and went to those other people and said, you know what, your debt's canceled with me. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, rejuvenated. You know, and bragged about the Lord rejuvenating his his uh, will because he's free of the debt that he owed, and he's going to pass on that joy and that savings to those that owed him. Yeah, very good. So I think um, also what's interesting is when you think about this as not just as a, in a money situation, but as it, someone who sins against you, because that's what Peter's question was. How often should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? So if we think of it as this person did something bad to me, what is your response? Evil for evil, which is what this guy did, or repaying good, doing what is good, which is this is something we talked about last time. So we don't repay evil for evil. That's not something that defines God's people. We don't we manifest ourselves as God's children by these things that we do, these characteristics of God that we um, we manifest in, in the earth. So the servant uh, asked his master to be patient with him. And that word patient is actually the same word we read last time in 2 Peter 3, 9, which we'll just look at real quick. So 2 Peter 3, 9, where we said the Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness. But is long suffering, I believe that's the word in question here, toward us, not purposing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, what that wicked slave was doing was robbing this other person of that opportunity to repent. When they see you acting a certain way, you know, so that's a, probably a big turnoff. But this word long, long suffering, what I'm going to be doing is switching over to the King James Plus version so we can look at words in the dictionary. And so this word long suffering is going to take a peek at, just show you. Um, long spirited, forbearing, patient. And so this is a, a characteristic of the Father that we're supposed to be demonstrating um, to others for the purpose of bringing them to repentance, just as you were brought to repentance. So if our Father in heaven was patient with you and me so that we could come to repentance and not perish, shouldn't we as children of our Father do the same for others who have sinned against us? Because it is by this love that we're told all will know we are disciples of Yehoshua. Because of the des desires of our Father in heaven, we should also wish to do. It's this kind of mercy, forgiveness, and love shown toward those who do not deserve it that manifests the name of our merciful forgiving and loving father in the earth because i don't have to tell you that when we were enemies to god he died for us rewarding our evil with his goodness let's read romans 5 6 through 11. for yet being without strength in due time messiah died for the ungodly for one will with difficulty die for a righteous one, yet perhaps one would even dare to die for a good one. But God commends his love toward us, and that while we were yet still sinners, Messiah died for us. So we were literally enemies to God. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Ultimately, that's the purpose of showing the, the character of God and the love of God on the earth is to spare people from the wrath. We don't want that to happen to anyone, just as God does not want that to happen to anyone. Verse 10, for if we were enemies, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord, Yehoshua Messiah, who by whom we have now received the reconciliation. 
So these are the same characteristics of our, our father that set us up, set us apart as belonging to him. And that set the children of God apart from the sons of disobedience who have been marked out for his wrath. This is kind of the um, connection I'm wanting to make with today's study is these two seeds they each have their own marks. And I'll just sum up this little section here of Colossians 3, 1 through 17. If then you were raised with Messiah, seek those things which are above, where Messiah is sitting at the right hand of God. Be mindful of things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life has been hidden with Messiah and God. When Messiah, our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. And these, these are the things that are of the flesh and of the world. Fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of which things sake, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Among whom you also once walked when you lived in these things. But now also put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, shameful speech out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, having put off the old man with his deeds and having put on the new, having been renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, foreigner, Scythian, slave or free man, but Messiah is in all things and all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender feelings of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving yourselves. Now, that doesn't mean forgiving me like myself, but forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against any, so forgive those who sin against you. As Messiah forgave you, so also you do. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness, perfectness, completion, and that the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. So now we see something ruling in the hearts of those who belong to God. They have the peace of God ruling in their hearts. And let the word of Messiah dwell in you, richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So those are a couple of things I want to just pull out, pull your attention to, because we're going to see this coming back. So God ruling in the heart and the word of God dwelling in you. And everything, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Yehoshua, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So we're manifesting things in the earth. We're doing things, word and deed. So there's just a couple things I want to bring out for this next section. We're going to get into the mark placed upon Cain now. Does anybody have anything else they want to add to any of that? Yeah, just uh, real quick from last week, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, it's interesting. You know, we, we always talk about him telling the end from the beginning, right? And what we see with these two brothers is really that picture of he he loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son you know and what i mean by that is there's a picture in both abel and in cain regarding what he's looking for in us bearing fruit right when it says his his brother's blood cried to him from the ground we talked about you know it robbed abel the ability to bear fruit and what that would have done for the world through his lineage and then you just talked about this with the 
long suffering for those that, you know, have time for repentance and, and can turn, you know, and what fruit they could possibly bear. Right. And that's why vengeance yeah. is, is God's. Right. So we see this, this overarching yeah. picture just in this one story, which is pretty cool. Um, and then just another kind of side note that I thought was interesting. You're talking about all the sevens and um, 70 times seven and, and Lamech saying uh, 77 times. In Genesis 5.31, Lamech lived to be 777 years old. So that was kind of interesting that fell within that timeline there. Yeah, and I, I can't presume to understand I can call that, but it's certainly interesting. You know these yeah. numbers are there for a reason. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a good point. Thank you. All righty. So we're going to get into the mark placed upon Cain. I'm going to be kind of diving a little bit deep with this, so I hope you'll stay with me. <laughs> Bear with me on it. So again, we're back at um, this mark that was set upon Cain. We're going to really be looking deep at, into the Hebrew words and making some cr uh, cross connections with scriptures. Um, we see that Yahweh placed this mark on Cain so that anyone who found him should not kill him. But we don't know what this mark was, except that it was placed upon Cain to be some kind of sign that those who would seek of, to avenge the blood of righteous Abel would somehow see and recognize that they should not take vengeance upon him. So I want to look at the word mark. So that is this Hebrew word oat or oath. <clears throat> and it's a signal, a flag, a beacon, monument, omen, prodigy, evidence, etc., mark, miracle, sign, or token. This is how the word is used in the scriptures. Um, when we read this verse and you know, at least for me you kind of just think of it like a little mark being placed on cain but this word really goes much beyond that genesis 4 this is is not the first time that this word is used the first time we saw this word being used actually it was back in genesis chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 14, which says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to divide between the day and the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So we could just translate that as, Let them be for marks and for seasons and for days and years. So that's the same word. These are very visible things that we can see. They're the very visible luminaries in the sky are for signs, oat which is the same word um, for this mark on Cain. This same word, oath, is used in Genesis 9 to describe the rainbow, something very visible, the sign of the covenant between God and all flesh, that he would not again flood the earth to destroy all flesh. This same word is used to describe the sign or mark of circumcision, something visible that God gave to Abraham. This word is also used for signs and miracles, like how we're told the religious leaders in Messiah's day were always looking for a sign. That would be the same word. Uh, often these signs or marks are easily observable, but not always. And that's kind of what I want to get into today. Some signs or marks are not always going to be plainly seen. And I, I was kind of reminded of Yehoshua's words to those who sought after these signs. So I wanted to read that. In Matthew 12, 38 through 42. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seek, seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights. In the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the proclaiming of Jonah. And behold, one greater than Jonah is here. 
the queen of the south shall rise up, rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, one greater than Solomon is here. The Greek word for sign here actually corresponds to that word mark that was placed upon Cain if we were to look at the Greek Septuagint, which is the old uh, ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament. So I want to look at this word sign in the Greek. Uh, I've got to switch to my King James. So it's the Samion word, an indication, especially ceremonial and supernaturally, a miracle, sign, token, wonder. So we see some of the same descriptions of that word, mark, oat. And uh, I want to also look at the root word for this word sign, which is semeno, semeino, something like that. And it's to indicate. It's a mark of uncertain derivation, but it's to indicate or signify something. So the sign of the prophet Jonah, let's go back to my verses here. The sign of the prophet Jonah is a little different than the sign of a rainbow. Here, Yehoshua describes significant events as signs. Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and nights. When he came out, he preached repentance to the people of Nineveh. The queen of Sheba tra traveled from afar to hear about Yahovah from Solomon. And when she heard his wisdom, she believed. This is like the original, like, kind of gospel type of thing happening. Um, these were signs from long ago or marks that speak of repentance and returning to the ways of God that the sons of disobedience could not see, just as they could not see that one greater than these was among them. My point in all this is that there is a possibility that the mark placed upon Cain wasn't necessarily a big X on his forehead or a strange birthmark that suddenly developed, but perhaps the mark was something else. Somebody's raising a hand, Keith. Yeah, and I and if we really look at the example he used, he's saying that, you know, he's using the example of a prophet, Jonah, or a priest. He's greater than him, and he's also greater than one of the kings that they thought was a great king, Solomon. So, you know, Yeshua is saying, and these are your examples of a great prophet and a great king that you know, here I am, and you're not even uh, heeding my words. Yeah, exactly. They And these are things that are in their scriptures. I think that's also a good point to bring out, is that um, these are Pharisees, these are religious leaders, scribes and Pharisees, who think they know God. And these are the things written in their book yet they don't recognize the sign. And there's good, we're going to see there's a reason for it. All right. Um, okay, so might not necessarily be a big, you know, visible mark on Cain, but we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 here that talks about all the curses that overtake the sons of disobedience. And they are called oat, signs or marks. Deuteronomy 28, 15, and 16 starts off this little section in the Torah about curses for disobedience. It says, And it shall be, if you will not listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, all these curses shall come on you and overtake you. You shall be cursed in the city and cursed in the field. I just wanted to read those two verses to kind of set the stage i won't go through the whole verse or the whole uh, section but he's talking about how these curses are going to come upon you and we discussed how cain was a man who went out and built himself a city and we've talked about how he is a man of the field who went out and killed his brother in the field and that representing the field of the world and i think it's safe to say as it's written here cain was cursed in the city and he was cursed in the field I thought that was an interesting um, connection to Cain specifically. 
So again, this chapter goes on to give a long list of all the curses that will overtake those who disobey God as Cain did. And then he says in verses 45 through 48, And all these curses shall come on you and shall pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you did not listen to the voice of Yahweh your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. And they shall be on you for a sign and for a wonder and on your seed forever. Because you did not serve Yahweh your God with joyfulness, joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies, which Yahweh shall send against you in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in the lack of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. So verse 45 reads, all these curses shall come on you and shall pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not listen to the voice of Yahweh your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. And to me, this sounded a lot like what we read about the avenger of blood. He shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you yourself are destroyed. read that Yahweh set a sign upon Cain. So this word is translated both ways. Verse 48. Did you lose everything? Go ahead. Uh, I was just talking with Ella. We lost. Yeah, I did too. So I want to go, go back a few minutes okay. because everything just froze and i and i saw you know everybody froze on my screen too us as well I saw that on my screen but okay thank you i'll yeah let me back up a little bit um let's go. so we you got i read the whole scripture you guys heard the whole scripture right yeah. and you bounced back up to verse yeah. uh, 45 and you were comparing okay. that to the avenger of blood yeah so him talking about how um all these curses are going to come upon you and overtake you because you didn't listen to the voice of God. And to me, that sounds a lot like what the avenger of blood would do. He's going to come upon you, pursue you and overtake you until you yourself are destroyed. And then in verse 46, click on that here. Whoops. Verse 46 said that all these curses shall be upon you for a sign. That's the same word, oath, and for a wonder, and on your seed forever. And this could just as easily have read, all these curses shall be upon you for a mark, and for a wonder, and on your seed forever. I think the same way it could be Genesis 4.15 could read, Yahweh set a sign upon Cain. It's this interchangeable uh, same word. And then verse 48 goes on to say that all these bad things will happen to the sons of disobedience until Yahovah, who is our avenger of blood, has destroyed them. So is it possible that the mark placed on Cain was marking him out to others as an enemy to God by all these curses that would be upon him as a mark and as a wonder? and would manifest themselves for all to see. This is a mark that would reveal that God is not with them because they are under these curses. Here in verse 45 through 46, Yahweh said, these curses shall be on you for a sign or mark and for a wonder and on your seed forever. And again, we've been kind of seeing this pattern of two seeds um, through the scriptures. Remember, Satan has seed. We've gone into detail explaining how Cain became a son or seed of the serpent, taking on the image and likeness of his father, the devil, and the most cunning beast of the field when he chose to ignore Yahovah's voice and his correction. 
And then he allowed the beast to sit on the throne of his heart, where there is no peace now, and rule over him when he unrepentantly murdered his brother. As the devil, his father was cursed in Genesis chapter 3, so was Cain cursed like him in Genesis chapter 4, because the desires of his father, the devil, he also wished to do. We didn't read anything about a mark being placed on Lamech, but the curses probably followed him because he was of Cain's seed. Perhaps this curse was placed upon Cain as a sign and wonder so that the righteous seed of God would look at him in his exile, knowing what he had done, and see all these curses and understand that they must not seek to take vengeance, destroy Cain, or those like him, because vengeance does not belong to us belongs to our Father in heaven. Perhaps this mark is another way of making distinction between the sons of God and the sons of the wicked one. I wanted to read Luke 6, 27 through 36. This is Messiah saying, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse, who curse you. And pray for those who despitefully use you. And to him who strikes you on one cheek, also offer the other. And to him who takes away your garment, do not forbid your tunic also. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them again. And as you desire that men should do to you, you do also to them likewise. Let's just pause for a second there because we're going to come up on something similar that he says later. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, for this is the Torah and the prophets. So just keep that in mind. This is a characteristic of the, son of, of the sons of God, characteristic of the Father. Verse 32, For if you love those who love you, what thanks do you have? For sinners also love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what thanks do you have? For sinners also do the same. And if you lend to those of whom you hope to receive, what thanks do you have? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much gain. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be the sons of the highest. For he is kind to the unfaithful and to the evil. Therefore, be merciful, even as your father is merciful. All right, so this is what's going to set us apart as sons of God. That, that, that's what makes us different. Because you can see people, evil, wicked, worldly people in the world doing good things. But how often do you see them doing good things for people who have done wrong to them? It's a big distinction. So perhaps the mark that God placed on Cain was physical, but let's just entertain the thought that it might have been a mark that is not seen with the eyes plainly because we know that Yahovah also marks his people. So I'll ask, do you think you have been marked by God? And how do you know that you were marked out as his? Do you have a special birthmark or a secret freckle that you can show everyone? <laughs> or is it more spiritual in nature? Let's look at some more scripture and see if we can find any parallels with how God marks his people, because we may gain some more insight on what Cain's mark might have been. God cursed Cain, but he blesses those who place their trust in him. And when he cursed Cain, we read last time how he was driven away from his face. So he was no longer, Yahweh's face is no longer upon him. We're going to get into like quite a bit of detail with this because I just think it's really important and fascinating. So numbers 6, 22 through 27, you're probably familiar with the ironic blessing. But pay attention, there's really specific stuff in here. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, In this way you shall bless the sons of Israel saying to them, Yahovah bless you and keep you. So Yahovah is going to bless and protect. Yahovah make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. So now that the blessing is having his face 
turning towards you, being in his presence and giving you his grace. Yahweh lift up his face to you and give you peace. Again, the God of all peace ruling on the throne of the heart. And they shall put my name upon the sons of Israel and I, I will bless them. So now we see his face shining upon them. We see peace, we see grace, but we also see blessings and his name being placed upon his people. This is really the opposite of what happens to those like Cain who have been cursed and driven away from Yahweh's face or his presence. Another example of Yahovah marking his people is found in Ezekiel 9. Yahovah tells a messenger to go into Jerusalem and place a mark on the foreheads of all those who sigh and cry for the abominations being done in the once holy city. And those who are marked are spared from God's wrath. So it's another correlation we're going to see. This is uh, Ezekiel 9, 4 through 6. Yahweh said to this messenger, go through in the midst of the city and in the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark on the foreheads of the men who are groaning and mourning because of all the abominations that are done in her midst. And he said to those in my hearing, go over in the city after him and strike. Let not your eyes spare nor have pity. Fully destroy old men, young men and virgins and little children and women. But do not come near any man on whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. And they began at the old men who were before the house. So now we see a certain group of people who oppose the abominations, the wicked things being done in the holy city and in the house of God. And they are being marked by God and spared from his wrath or his punishment and judgment. We also see that God's judgment begins at his house with those who were supposed to be handling his words but they were doing something else with them. Now this, this word mark here is different. It's not the same word, but it's the same concept. It's the Hebrew word tav, not oath, but it's the same idea. Um, interestingly, the tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is also a representation of the Messiah. In ancient Hebrew, it actually looks like a cross. Um, so I'm gonna look at just a, that Hebrew word for uh, mark, really quick, tav. This is a mark by implication, a signature, desire or mark. And uh, I kind of thought this was interesting, this signature. And then the root word for this is tava, meaning to mark out. That is scratch or imprint or scrabble. So this this mark seems to have some kind of connection to writing, which I will see kind of play out in just a minute. Make note also of the location of this mark. We're told it is to be placed in the forehead. And it's protecting the one who is marked from God's judgment. The difference here is that Cain's mark was protecting him from the wrath of man. And we are told not to worry about what man could do, who can only destroy the body. We're told to fear him who can destroy both body and soul in this consuming fire, if you will. So his mark, King's mark, was to protect him from the wrath of man, not from the wrath of God. I can think of a few places where Yahovah places a mark or seal on those who obey his voice and then spares them from his judgment. One of those places is the first Passover. Those who obeyed God and put the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorposts of their dwelling were spared from death. And this blood, too, was called an oath, a mark or sign for them. So let's look at that. Regarding the Passover lamb, Exodus 12, 5 through 7 says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. 
and she'll take some of the blood and strike on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses in which they shall eat it. Make note that this blood was to be painted on the door posts of their homes. Skipping down to verse 12 and 13. Ooh, sorry, got a little wonky there says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. I am Yahovah, and the blood shall be a sign, oat, to you upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you for a destruction when I smite in the land of Egypt. This blood on the doorposts of their houses was a mark that spared them from death. This, I think we all are aware, is a shadow picture of what the blood of Yehoshua, our true Passover lamb, would do for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it is written, Therefore purge out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for also Messiah, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. If the blood of the Passover lamb painted on the doorposts of their homes spared them from death, then how much more will the blood of the true Passover lamb spare us from the second death now? And if the blood of the Passover lamb painted on the doorposts of their homes was for a mark or a sign between the people and Yahovah, how much more will the blood of Yehoshua, our Passover lamb, be for a sign or mark on our bodies, which are the spiritual houses that we dwell in? 1 Peter 1, 17 through 25. He says, and if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to the work of each one, pass the time of your earthly residence in fear, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, silver or gold, from your vain manner of life hounded down to you from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Messiah as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, indeed having been foreknown before the foundation of the world, but revealed in the last times for you, those believing in God through him, he who raised him up from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope might be in God purifying your souls in the obedience of the truth through the spirit to unfeigned love of the brethren love one another fervently out of a pure heart having been born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible through the living word of god and abiding forever for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of men as the flower of the grass the grass withers and its flower falls out, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word preached to you, preached as gospel to you. And just going straight into chapter two, which is a continuation of this thought, he says, therefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envyings and all evil speaking, desire the sincere milk of the word as newborn babes so that you may grow by it. If you have tasted that the Lord is gracious for having been drawn to him, a living stone, indeed rejected by men, but elect precious with God, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Messiah Yehoshua. So make note that the sign or mark of the blood of Yehoshua that covers us is not a mark or sign. Are you guys still with me or did you lose me again? You're good, okay. So make note that the mark or sign of the blood of Yehoshua that covers us is not a mark or sign that can be seen with the naked eye. It is a spiritual mark between Yahovah and his people. When Yahovah returns in his wrath, wrath, he will see the blood of Yehoshua on us and will pass over us, and we will not be destroyed. Uh, Keith, did you have a question? So in your, you're making this point that, yeah, we can't see the sign, but the way the sign shows is because you actually 
act in God's character. You are a representative yes. of Yah. That's how his name is placed upon you, is that you are keeping his character. And anybody that observes you knows that you are different because you are doing the things that you were instructed by your father's words. It's almost as if you are wearing the signet ring of the house of Yahovah and that you have yes. authority. Oh, oh, oh. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> That's going to tie in later really nicely. Okay, great. So, yeah, this idea of being a physical mark, in a way it is, because your actions are physical. Everything you do is physical. You're a physical being. It's just, yeah. it's not, you're not complacent in the way that, you know, walking around with some mark on your head or something. It's your actions and you are marked for the purpose of Yahovah. So that's that's exactly sort of the point I'm going to make. I I am so appreciative that you spoke that up because really, if that's the case, then we could really take the the opposite of that and say, could that be the mark that was placed upon Cain and those like him? They are not doing those things. So I think that there's a, there is validity to that. So we're going to make note here of how Peter is quoting from Isaiah when he says flesh is as grass. He's likening man to plant life. Flesh is as the grass that, the, that fades and withers away. However, if the word of God, which is eternal, is within us, though our flesh may wither and die, we shall never die. Messiah says in John 11, 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Make note of the clear message of the scriptures that it is by both the blood of Yehoshua and the word of God that gives life to those who receive it and spares us from death. And so then there's another example found in Revelation 9, 1 through 5. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from the heaven, a star fall from the heaven to the earth, and it was given the key of the abyss. And it opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke came forth locusts onto the earth, and authority was given to them as the scorpions of the earth have authority. And they were commanded not to hurt the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months and their torment was like a scorpion's torment when he stings a man again we see something being placed on the foreheads this time it's called a seal so i want to look at the word seal here and its root uh, a seal sprigis i'm just trying as best i can to say these words <laughs> It's a signet as fencing in or protecting from misappropriation. By implication, the stamp impressed as a mark of privacy, of genuineness, literally or figuratively a seal. Comes from probably this word frazo to fence or enclose. That is specifically to block up, to stop. So this kind of, you know. Keith was kind of hinting at this idea of a seal, the signet ring, and we're going to really see a, a cool connection with that. But there's protection involved here now with this seal that's in the forehead. This verse is using figurative language rather than saying, don't harm the people who have the seal of God in their foreheads. It says, don't harm any green thing. Then makes the comparison to men saying, but only harm those men. Who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. So the implication is that those who do have the seal of God in their foreheads are again being protected by God. 
As we just saw, scripture often compares men to, pl to plant life. Here, the green plants are being spared. And I know I've probably shared this story with most of you, but I'm gonna share it again about how my daughter responded when I read her this verse when she was much younger. She had a very keen and simple insight that I have never forgotten. When I asked her why the green things were not, not harmed, I was gonna say something you know, I had my own thought about what I wanted to say about that, but she quickly replied, it's because green means there's life in it. So, of course, the words when I heard this of Messiah came to my mind, that I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Like Revelation being the, probably the most difficult book of the Bible a child can hear because it is being revealed to her by her father in heaven our elohim is not the elohim of the dead he is the elohim of the living thus you may touch those men who do not have the seal of the living god in their foreheads but you cannot touch the ones who have life in them who do have the seal of the living god in their foreheads uh keith yeah, that reminds me of, so you're saying there's these people walking around that don't have the seal, and that's like called the walking dead? Is that the way we can look at that? <laughs> in a sense, in a sense, the, the zombie apocalypse might be a, a real thing in a way. <laughs> I know. Who knows? That might be, they're marked and they're walking around like that, huh? <laughs> All right, Revelation 7, 1 through 3 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, so that the wind should not blow on them, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Do not hurt the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God, in their foreheads. You can see how the word seal and the word marker sign are very closely related and seem to parallel one another in some way. Another example in Romans 4, Paul speaks about the marker sign of circumcision, which we know is that word oath, and also calls it a seal and uses the same Greek word for seal that is used in Revelation. So I thought that was a, a neat connection, kind of showing that marks and seals are connected. He says, uh, he's speaking about Abraham, and he received a sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, while still uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all those who believing through one's circumcision for righteousness to be imputed to them also. So my point here is just this, a sign of circumcision, a seal, of the righteousness of faith. By this, we can see that a sign or mark can also be a seal. Here's another example of a seal in the Tanakh with our next example of God's mark on his people. I'm going to kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent, so please bear with me. It's a little deep, but it's just too wonderful to skim over, and you'll hopefully see all this come together really beautifully. So I'm going to read to you from Isaiah 8, 16 through 20. Bind up the testimony, seal the Torah among my disciples, and I will wait on Yahovah who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahovah has given me are for signs, oat, and for wonders in Israel, for Yahovah, from Yahovah of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. And they shall say to you, seek to the mediums and to the wizards who peep and mutter, should not a people seek to their God than for the living to the dead? This is an interesting little verse here. It's people seeking to mediums and wizards who talk to dead for advice to the living. They said God is not a God of the dead, but the God of the living. And they say, shouldn't you seek the living God for those who are living? I just thought that was an interesting connection. And then verse 20. To the Torah and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So this to me sounds, I can hear Yehoshua speaking here. 
bind up the testimony and seal the Torah among my disciples. And then he says, behold, I and the children who Yahovah has given have given to me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from Yahovah who dwells in Mount Zion. I want to look at the word disciple. We know Yahushua had disciples. Um, just to kind of illustrate that word is someone who is instructed, a disciple, learned, or taught one. When we think about a disciple, we tend to think about the 12 disciples. But if we follow Yehoshua and hear his words being taught by him, by Yahovah through him, and not by man, then we too are his disciples and his children. Yehoshua would sometimes refer to his disciples as his children. So here it says, go back here. I and the children whom Yahovah has given me shall be for signs, oat, and wonders. When Yehoshua prayed to the Father, he said something similar about the disciples whom the Father had given to him. Again, don't think he's only speaking about the twelve, but about all the children that the Father has drawn to Yehoshua to be taught by him. So Messiah says in John 17, 6 through 17, I have revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known all things, whatever you have given me, are from you. For I have given them the words which you gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am in the world no longer, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, those whom you have given me, so that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those that you have given me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray for you to take them out of the world, but for you to keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So here we read that Yehoshua's disciples or children have been given to him by the Father. He has revealed the Father's name to them. He has given the Father's word and taught them. They have received and kept the Father's word. That is to say, they have guarded and protected it. And they themselves are being kept, which is to say, guarded and protected in the Father's name. And it sounds a lot like that seal that was in the forehead, protecting those who belong to God. So by connecting these things with what we just read in Isaiah 8, we can see a correlation between receiving and keeping the Father's word, being sealed with Yehoshua, and being kept or protected in the Father's name. So let's go back and look at a few more things in Isaiah 8, 16. Um, here, where it says, seal the Torah among my disciples. That word among is really just a letter. So I'm going to show you what I mean by that. We're going to look at the Hebrew. I know this might be difficult um, for you to understand, but I'm going to highlight here and hopefully it'll make sense. So this word I'm highlighting is what's translated as among my disciples. It's the Hebrew word bit limudi. Limudi is disciples. 
the word bit in front is the letter bait. And when you put a bait in front of a word, let me just highlight the bait. That's the word that's being translated as among. Or that's the letter, I should say, that's being translated as among, the bait. So when you put a bait in front of a word, it'll make that word say in, within, on, upon. It can also be among. But um, I think a better translation here would be seal the Torah in or within my disciples rather than among. Why? Because we know that is where Yahovah writes it. That's where he writes his Torah in, within his people. So let's switch back to English and read that. You're all, I'm sure, familiar with Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahovah. I will put my Torah in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Who belongs to God? According to this, those who have been marked out as belonging to Yahweh will have his Torah written in their inner, inward parts. So seal that Torah within my taught ones. This is a mark that God can see. For we know that he does not look at outward appearances. He looks at our hearts. Verse 16 says, the Torah and the testimony are being bound and sealed within his disciples. And later says, if we do not speak according to these words, the Torah and the testimony, then there is no light in us. So what is this testimony? Let's look at the word testimony. It's the Hebrew word teudah. It means attestation. That is a precept, usage, testimony. Um, wanted to look at this in Brown Driver Briggs. So this is Brown Driver Briggs. Uh, same, pretty much the same thing, but looking at... Uh, The root word, oud, says to return, repeat, go about, do again, to surround, go around, go around, um, restore, relieve, to bear witness, to bear witness, say again and again, to testify, to bear witness. So this is that word, to the uh, bind up the testimony, this witness that is said again and again. Now, that's really what the, the prophets were preaching, the same message again and again. Let me go back to text. Bind up the testimony, the witness, the warning, the message that is repeated again and again. As we have seen over and over again, just in this short time that we've been in Genesis, the Torah and the prophets, the Tanakh, or what is commonly called the Old Testament, are repeatedly testifying of Yehoshua, the Messiah. And these words are called truth. So I will be so bold as to say that this is Yehoshua speaking, saying, bind up this testimony of me and seal the Torah within my disciples. If we choose to reject these words of truth, what we are actually rejecting is the testimony and witness of the true Messiah. And the scriptures say, if we don't have a love for the truth, then we will believe a lie. We might believe in a false Messiah. Yehoshua spoke to the unbelieving religious leaders in Jerusalem about this testimony of him on more than one occasion. John 5, 37 through 47. And he's sending me, this is Messiah speaking, and he's sending me, the Father himself has borne witness of me. Neither have you heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe in him whom he has sent. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are the ones witnessing of me. And you will not come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, 
but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe, you who receive honor from one another, and do not seek the honor that comes from God only? Do not think I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Yehoshua came to these religious leaders himself being sealed in the Father's name as the word of God made flesh. And unlike his disciples, these men did not receive him. Verse 38 said, you do not have the Father's word abiding in you, which he then equates to not having the Father's love abiding in them in verse 42. Yehoshua also said that the Torah and the prophets are love. When he asks, uh, someone asked, which is the greatest commandment in the Torah? Yehoshua said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the Torah and the prophets. The Torah and the prophets in the heart of man will reveal the love of God. Yehoshua also said that it is through our love for one another that others will know that we are his disciples. Like so many religious leaders today, these men proclaim the word of God with their mouths, professing to know God, but have set their hearts on the doctrine, tradition, and honor of men, and in so doing have not only rejected the true Messiah and the testimony of him, but the true love of God. He speaks of this love here in Matthew 7, 12 through 14. Therefore, all things, whatever you desire that men should do to you, do even so to them, for this is the Torah and the prophets. Go in through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are who go in through it, because narrow is the gate and constricted is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So Yehoshua first speaks of the love of the Torah and the prophets, and then immediately says, walking on the straight and narrow path will not be easy like the path that most people are going to take. It'll be narrow and difficult. So let's look at those words straight and narrow just really quickly. Straight, this word translated as straight. Stenos, narrow. Um, I don't need to look at the root. So it's just a narrow place. And then straight and narrow is this word narrow. Is flebo to crowd, afflict, narrow, throng, suffer tribulation, trouble. What is interesting is, uh, I've got this little uh, Greek to Hebrew lexicon in here. And what it will do is it'll take a Greek word and tell you the Hebrew equivalence to that word. And I just want to point out this one. Strong 6887 Sarar. Because it'll come up here in just a minute. So Yahushua has taught us that the Torah and the prophets are the testimony or witness of him. That if we have received these words from God within us then the love of God will be abiding in us and will be revealed through us. And here he teaches that if we are walking according to these words, then there will be pressing, there will be obstacles and tribulation for his namesake that many will not be able to endure. And now I want to look at this word bind. Bind up the testimony. Seal the Torah among my disciples. To cramp, uh, to afflict, to besiege, to bind up, distress, enemy, narrower, oppress, pangs, shut up, be in a strait. And guess what? It's that same word, sarar, that I wanted you to, to see that Greek to Hebrew connection. 
Um, I also wanted to look at the ancient Hebrew Sarar, if I can find it quickly. I think this is it. Something that is bound up tight, bundle, bind. Um, just this idea of being in a tight, uncomfortable place, kind of like, well, I'm not going to go there. Tight, and uncomfortable place. And that, to me, sounds like the straight and narrow path that he spoke of, this testimony of him. Make narrow and difficult this testimony of me. Not many are going to endure it. Seal this Torah within my taught ones. Many are going to read it. Not many are going to understand it. Perhaps there is a connection to walking the narrow, difficult path that Yehoshua has called us to walk, and the few who have the true testimony of the true Messiah and the Torah of the Father. All right, now this word is a seal. I want to look at the word seal the Torah among my disciples. Let's go to Strong's. So, um, oops, it's not the word. There it is. Seal is hatham, to close up, especially to seal, make an end, mark, seal, or stop up. Now, the ancient Hebrew also gives an interesting um, definition of this word. As a document is rolled up and sealed with wet clay, the signet ring of the owner bears the image of his seal and is pressed into the clay to seal something closed. So that really stood out to me as a very interesting uh, meaning to this word seal. It's related to a signet ring or seal that the owner would press and it made in the image of the owner <laughs> and pressed into the clay to show ownership. And consider that the scriptures liken us people to clay vessels and their seal. Uh, oops. And Yahovah is the potter. So we're clay vessels. He's the potter who has impressed his seal upon those who belong to him. But also kings would use their signet ring, which is what Keith had just brought up, to seal their letters. This is the same word for seal used in the book of Esther, where we have an example of this regarding letters sent out under the king's authority. And it says in Esther 8.8, 8, And you write for the Jews as it pleases you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring no man can turn back no man can revoke it no man can undo it whatever is sealed in the king's with the seal, king's seal in his name and which he has written and sealed with his ring cannot be revoked so consider that with the mindset that Yehoshua is the king. He is the king of kings. And his Torah in you is his sealed letter. Write in the king's King Yehoshua's name and seal it with the King Yehoshua's ring. For the writing which is written in the King Yehoshua's name and sealed with the King Yehoshua's ring, no man can turn back. If you have been blessed, marked and sealed by Yahweh, then you have been blessed, marked and sealed in the Father's name. It is written that what God has blessed, no man can reverse, and his people are likened to letters of Yehoshua, who is the King of Kings. 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, I'm sorry, 3.2, says, You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. An epistle is a letter. It having been made plain that you are the epistle, the letter of Messiah, ministered by us, not having been written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone. So now that's making the reference to the 
the Torah, the Ten Commandments, the words, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. So you are the letter by the king of the king. It is also written in the Torah that the king of Israel must write for himself a copy of the Torah. Again, imagine this applying to Yehoshua, who is the true eternal king of Israel. Deuteronomy 17, 18 says, And it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write a copy of this Torah in a book from before the priests, the Levites. So he's going, and he's going to read it. It will be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear Yahweh's God, to keep all the words of this Torah and these statutes to do them. So this idea of him writing in the Torah within our hearts and then sealing us with his seal. As King Yehoshua is keeping this command and we are his letters. And if we are letters of Messiah, having the Torah written and sealed within our hearts, as the scripture has said, and having been sealed with our king's seal, then what has been written by our king and sealed with his seal cannot be reversed. What can man do to you? You have been sealed by the King of Kings and are under the authority and protection of the Almighty. He says, I have called you by name, you are mine. I hope you're seeing that the word of God and the name of God are synonymous to the seal of God and connected to a mark that he places upon his people. Um, I want to, let me see how many more verses I have here. This is kind of, it's not too many, but we're getting close to needing to wrap up here. Um, I hate to cut it off here. Do you guys want to need to go? I can continue next time. Um, but we're going to just finish up this section either today or I can finish it up next time with uh, how the Torah talks about these, um, his words being his marks for us. You guys want to do it uh, next time? Anyone? Yeah, I, I actually got a drop uh, here, but okay. I can catch up on the when you guys post it. But I so thank oh, that's you. okay. I'll just go ahead and wrap it up here, um, and we'll continue next time. Just wrapping up this little section um, about God marking His people, connecting it back to Cain, um, and then we'll have something else to discuss probably. Uh, about this next time so anything else anybody wants to add or make note of comments Keith? yeah earlier you were speaking about the the gate and the narrow way and you know that idea that yeshua is the door or the gate and he knows just how narrow it is to reach him on the path. So yeah, this, this this idea that we have, you know, two choices. There's a there's this one wide path with really really wide boundaries that people like to walk, and they go far to the left and far to the right, and they don't really stay on the path. And uh, mm -hmm. that scripture that you were reading is when you were mentioning the gate. And that's what came to mind with Yeshua being the one that defines the path that leads to the gate, which he's going to uh, admit those people into the kingdom. Yeah, it reminds me of also the parable of the sower when the seed falls among the sto stony places where at first they, they hear the word with joy and they're like, yeah, but then when trial or tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, for Messiah's sake, they fall away because it's too hard. The The narrow straight path is not an easy one to walk. It reminded me, Keith, of that uh, video you shared at Passover with the sheep and the shepherd and that narrow entryway where they would, uh, he would bring him in for the night and then he would kind of sleep in that doorway, right? exactly and uh you know in isaiah 8 when you were going over the bind up the testimony and that bind 
being narrow. And then of course the, the word for disciple, that Lamud word has the Lamed in there, like the shepherd staff and the, the word picture, the Lamed being leader and the um, Mem water or nations and, and leading the nations to the Dilet, the door and having that uh, picture of that shepherd right in that doorway in that narrow doorway that you know he can protect them there i thought that was kind yeah, of yeah that is what a disciple is supposed to do this disciple is not supposed to make disciples of himself but to lead others to the door and if we're reflecting his character in the earth that's how we're going to do that and pointing them to what the word really says that was a huge part of it Anybody else? All right. All right. Keith, well, thank you, you for wanna... bearing with me. Keith, did you want to pray? Sure, I can pray. Heavenly Father, we gathered together today to study your instructions, seek out your blessings revealed in your words. You sent your son to reveal such blessings. And may you lead us on the path to your kingdom. Blessed be your name and Yeshua Messiah. We praise your great name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Keith.